Hello everyone, uh, this is GM Josh Fidel and today I'll be conducting the Insane in the Endgame lecture. Uh, this I think will be the last week of this and then we're switching up the, le the lectures to do different things. Uh, so today I wanted to show a couple games that occurred recently in the Tata Steel tournament. Uh, I, I'm going to show one and if there's time I'll show another. Uh, I never know how the uh, pace will be. Uh, I am looking at chat, so good evening everyone. Uh, I can see you guys. Uh, so, and I will be asking you guys questions, so feel free in the YouTube chat to you know, suggest moves and do things like that, ask me questions. So I wanted to talk about endgame technique today. So th there are textbook endgame techniques, like especially the games of Capablanca, it shows pristine, beautiful endgame technique. And that's really great to learn. That's things to, to figure out. And I really recommend studying that. But this is more what I'd call real world technique, meaning that this is what happens in a regular game, even between two elite GMs. Part of it is that because people defend really well, like nothing against Capablanca's play, but a lot of his opponents defended very poorly or they played passively. And you don't see that too often. Even players who are not as advanced, like even you know amateur players, whatever, they still know to play actively and defend actively. So most games don't look like Capablanca's games. Also, most of us are not as good <laughs> as Capablanca at this. So it's important to know how to you know, navigate your way through technique when it's not perfect, when there are so many flaws and there are so many complications. Because a lot of the times you can't just win smoothly. You have to try to go with, roll with the punches and figure things out. And this game between Dubov and Grendelius, which I'm showing now, is a great example of that. Uh, and this was actually a really cool one because I showed a game before between Grendelius and Caruana where uh, Grendelius lost. And Grendelius has been having a rough tournament. So to, get a, to try to beat uh, Dubov was pretty big. So, all right. And hello everyone. Hey, someone from Maine. I'm actually from New Hampshire, so Maine was very close by. Anyways, Knight C6 was played in the game. But I wanted to talk about this position first. So in this position, black is up a pawn. But I would argue it's not a super clear pawn. I mean, you have these you have this extra pawn, the A pawn, but it's not gonna queen anytime soon. I would argue the rook on a4 is a little bit off, at least sometimes. Like it's active, but it also can end up stuck there. So this position, and again, like I would say the queen, king side pawn structure is kind of tough for black because activating your king is difficult. White has ideas of just pushing. So I believe that this position is actually quite difficult. So live free or die, exactly. Uh, knight b3 uh, was played here by Dubov, which makes sense, trying to maybe play knight c5, controlling some queen side squares. So this position, I wanted to show what the, some of the difficulties for, for black. So what would you guys play here as black? I'm kind of curious. All right. Yeah, I actually don't know. I'd say this is a French pawn structure, though, the, these three pawns here. But I don't think it came from a French. It came from something else, I believe. But it could be Karo Khan because of what happened over here. So depends. So I'm seeing B pawn pushes. B6 makes sense to restrict the knight. The drawback to B6 is you don't really have a follow-up plan that I can see. So let's say you play B6 here. I think as white, I would probably just play F4. And the, the idea is that I'm just going to start pushing my pawns over here, and it's going to be very uncomfortable. So here's kind of the real question. Would you play, like, b5 is what was played in the game, so we'll go over that. Knight a5 is a very re reasonable move, which I looked at. So probably white should trade uh, the knights. And I would say this rook end game, again, if it were balanced, then maybe black would just have a winning position. But because this pawn structure, because it's really hard to push, I think this is difficult. So white can play f4. And I actually think black has a clever idea of playing rook a6. So the idea here is, what do you think my idea is if you play f5 now? What do you guys think black could play? Again, I'm looking at YouTube chat, seeing what you guys have to say. <clears throat> 
King f8 is possible, but the problem with a move like King f8 is I play f6. And I feel like if your king runs too far, I'm just going to try to queen over here. And otherwise, your rook again is kind of stuck. So this is not really what I'd like. Rook b6 check's possible, but I just move out of the way. I don't, I don't know if you're achieving too much. b5, I would argue the same. Like, I can play with f6 at some point. But Manny has it, I think, f6. So this prevents the pawn push. And if we trade all these pawns, it's really going to favor black because this rook kind of gets out. And then the extra pawn can really make a difference. I still don't think this is an easy win or something, but this is at least a decent idea. The problem for us as black is that white is in no way obligated to play f5. White could play rook f1, rook g1, any kind of improving move. Let's say rook g1, maybe trying to play g5. And it's still really tough to just win this game. This rook just can't enter the position. That's the main problem. So sure, eventually black can play rook c6, rook c4, b5, b4, trying to break apart these pawns. But it takes a lot of time. And in the meantime, you have to worry about g5 stuff. And f5 eventually is still coming. It's just a really, really tricky position to win. So knight a5 was a possible move, but I don't think it was that clear. Instead, Grandelius played b5. So here, I have two questions for you. First of all, what is black's aim with this move? And the second question is, how should white respond? White's move here is actually extremely important. And yeah, I, uh, Bob, I, I see these questions a lot. Like, do you want to trade when you're up material and stuff? And in general, yes. If you could trade off the knights and the rooks and then get a king and pawning up a pawn, you'd be winning. That's, that's nice. But I would also say that sometimes trades aren't that simple. Like trading knights into a rook endgame, sometimes rook endgames can be drawish. And here, I don't know if the trade of knights actually helps black that much. Uh, sometimes having the knights makes the win easier. So you have to be careful about this dogma that you should trade when you're ahead. A lot of times you should not. Uh, one of my pet peeves is when people trade queens when they're attacking because they want to go to a pawn up endgame rather than just continue attacking a pawn up. <laughs> uh, but that's another story. So white can play knight d2, but the problem is this move is very passive. Uh, it puts a knight on a more passive square, and something like b4 is coming, which I think is going to be very strong. So I don't think knight d2 is the best move. So b5, b4 is surely black's threat. I absolutely agree with that. For example, let's say this f4 move again. I play b4, and all of a sudden you have big problems. If you try to play f5 just ignoring my play, I have different options, but even just takes, rook c4 check, you have to defend this pawn, knight b4 check, and this is just a disaster. My pieces are becoming extremely active. The fact that I have this pawn on a7 is actually not even the most relevant thing. Mainly the problem is that your pieces just get kicked around here. You can't allow play a move like this because of the fork. So you'd have to play back, I can check you here, you have to go back, I go here. And this is just an example of like kind of a nightmare. <laughs> This is what black wants, right? Like you have to go back to c1, and or maybe you have knight d2. Uh, but okay, black can even play a move like this, just trying to take this pawn. But this is an example of a position where everything is going wrong uh, for white. So I would really not recommend that. King e2 might have been a better defense. I saw someone mention that. But this is exactly what white does not want. So the question is, how do you deal with the move b4? So Ken has the right idea, which is you play the move rook c1. And this is what I mean by modern defense. I feel like in Capablanca's day, most chess players at least would not find a move like rook c1, or at the very least, it wouldn't be consistent. And because of that, they, they would not, um, they, they would just die. Like b4 would just kill them. And I think that because defense, largely due to computers, has improved so much, it means that your opponents are going to find moves like this and make your life difficult. So here, uh, Grandelius does opt to play knight a5. My main question is, what does rook c1 do to prevent b4? What do you guys think? How does rook c1 help stop b4? The knight hangs, so that's part of it. And yeah, I actually didn't, um, I'm actually not 100% sure, but I think that both moves look very possible here. So c4, the idea is that now c takes d is a threat, if takes, rook takes. And you can see how important it is, the placement of pieces. 
The fact is that this rook at a4 just is really badly placed. And because of that, white's kind of crashing through. If black tries something like this, you can trade and take this pawn at the very least. So it's actually a very, very annoying position. Maybe black can try something like this to put a knight on d5. But even here, this rook on a4 is actually a really terrible piece. And I feel like even here, you can play this followed by rook takes pawn, and this is not going well. Uh, I'm not really sure exactly what black should try. Maybe something like knight moves immediately is possible. Uh, but even here, right, like if, if takes the knight and then c5 is a move you have to worry about, even just king b3 trying to take this pawn, I feel like things have gone horribly wrong for black. c takes b also looks possible, though, with the idea that after knight takes, and keep in mind, you can't take with the rook now. That's the key, because the knight's hanging. So here you have to play check. And rook c7, something like this. And here you have to be careful. After rook a2 check, you can't go to c3 because of rook c2 check skewering. But you can go back here. And I feel like, I guess rook takes f2 guards the f7 pawn, though. That's kind of the problem. So hmm, probably still good, for, still good for black. So mo most likely, the more accurate way to play is just with c4. Although I have to say, this might also have some possibilities. Like after check, maybe here you have to play a sneaky move like knight c1 to stop knight d3 and this. And now you're threatening king b3. So even this may be not so clear. But overall, I think c4 is a simpler way to do things. But rook c1 is definitely the best defensive move, no doubt about that. So you can play a move like king f8, trying to improve your king. This is kind of my instinct here. But even here, I couldn't really find anything. After f4, king e7, f5, I wasn't sure who improved more. I mean, white gets this move in, which is really annoying. And I don't really see what to do. Like, b4 still just doesn't work for me. So I don't really think this is a big improvement for black. So even though this is what I kind of wanted to do, I didn't think it was so simple. So uh, let us see. So in the game. Ah, yes, he played knight a5. So in the, uh, I, I guess my main question for you is, as white, would you retreat the knight or take or play knight c5? What do you guys think? What would you guys do here? So I see some people say retreat, some people say take. But I don't see too many reasons. Like one speaker said Daniil probably plays 92 to keep pieces on the board. Uh, I would argue, though, that keeping pieces on the board doesn't necessarily help you draw here. Like I think trading into a rook endgame is not a bad way to try to draw. So I think it really depends. Keep in mind also that after 92, it's very possible to play knight c4 check. Right? So it, you're not really stopping the trade anyway. So knight c5 was suggested. The problem with knight c5 is that I can play the move knight c4 check. And this move is very nasty, because your king just doesn't have a safe home. If it goes here, I check it. If it goes to c2, I can, I can check it on a2. So you'd have to go somewhere like this. But now, at the very least, I can just play rook a3. And this feels like my knight and rook are very strong. This knight on c5, it's on an outpost. It looks pretty, but it does almost nothing. <laughs> it's one of those knights that's just like, it looks nice, but it really doesn't help your position. So I would argue that this position is very, very bad for white. So knight c5, I don't like. Knight d2 was played in the game. Knight takes c5, I think, would be probably the best, um, the best try. And you, once again, you go to this rook endgame and play f4. So the fact that black has to move b5 in is, is interesting, but not necessarily that bad. Like Black can try to play rook a4, for instance, but here you can play f5. And the problem, again, is that b4 runs into king b3, so you can't really play that move so easily. And in the meantime, white just has this nasty kind of counterplay. And if white, black tries to play rook c4 and b4, 
you have the option of moving the rook to a more active post. So say rook a1 threatening the a pawn. And again, I, I just don't think this is so easy. I think that once white's rook gets active, the fact that white's pawn structure is more advanced and a bit better, meaning this king is not so good, is going to cost black a lot. So black can maybe try rook a6 again with this f6 idea. But even this, I, I just didn't think was so clear. f5 is still playable. Uh, but white can also just try to bring the king up or something like that. And it's just not so easy. I think that this position is going to be very, very difficult to win for black. But I, I still think that there are chances, right? Like it's not unplayable. I'm not saying that a5 is a bad move. I think it was a difficult choice. But I would argue that uh, probably white sh should go for this capture. Uh, the black, oh, you mean the position with uh, knight c5, I see. Um, so yeah, after knight c5, yeah, the problem here is that the black rook is stuck for the moment, but the white rook is also stuck, and the knight can't move either because it would allow this. So in a way, I'd say that all of white's pieces are stuck, whereas just our rook is stuck. And in the meantime, by the way, we can play a5, b4 to free our rook anytime we want. So I would argue that even though the rook's a bit stuck, it's only stuck temporarily, and I think that in the long term, like the knight on c5 just does nothing. So uh, maybe white can try f4, f5, but I, I don't believe it. I think that uh, black's going to crash through with this pawn pretty soon. So in the game, Dubov played the move knight d2. And this move, I think, is probably not so great. But the question is, how would you take advantage of it from the black side? Yeah, but thanks for the question, Juan. I, I would say that a lot of people probably have the same question, like why is black doing well with such a stuck rook? So I'm happy to answer questions like that. I think that usually if you have a, a pressing question about the position, someone else is wondering the same thing, is usually what I tell uh, people when I teach classes. So uh, I'm always glad to get those questions. So knight c4 check is one option. What other options does black have, and which one, which one do you like better? Like, what are your, what's your reasoning? Yeah, I agree with you, Scott. It's a very complicated game. And I would say Grandelius played this phase of the game beautifully, but even at certain later points, he still uh, could have spoiled it. So it's, and not, not because he's like has bad endgame technique or anything like that. It's just such an immensely complicated position. Uh, but that means it's a lot of fun for us to go over. I, I like going over games that are messy like this sometimes more than the, the beautiful, clean Capablanca games can be nice. But at some point, like, you know, when you see games like this with, you know, changes and, all this, like co all these complications, things that are hard to figure out. At least to me, that resembles more of you know what our games would look like. Like I don't get to play too many games with like clear cut, beautiful plans that never get spoiled. You know, it just it's not how tournament chess works generally. So knight c six trying to play a five is is logical, but I can also move my knight back, and then white's doing fine. So so a lot of you are suggesting knight c four check. I think this would be a mistake after knight takes c four. So first of all, if rook takes c4, you have to deal with rook, the rook getting active with rook a1. If b takes c4, so d takes c4, I can play f4. And the problem is that this f on is still coming, and b4 is never good. And this rook on a4 is really an, just not a good piece. It would so much rather be out. And I guess you can play like this, but at some point, I can still play f5 and eventually rook a1 when your rook moves. Uh, I can also think about something like d5 here followed by this and trying to take your pawn. And this also looks very promising to me. I think that because black's king is so passive, it's just going to be very, very difficult here. And if you take with the b pawn, I can play f4 again. And let's say rook a6. f5 immediately does run into f6, I believe. But let's say white plays a move like rook a g1, just for example. How is black going to make progress here? If check, I can probably just bring my king over. And again, what are you doing? If you move your rook back, I go back. If you push your a pawn, I just attack it. You basically have no plan here at all. So I think that even though you've simplified, quote unquote, I think that you've simplified into a position where winning for black will be very difficult because you just don't have a winning plan. And it's because you're kind of getting owned on the king side here. Your king side's so paralyzed, you can't just win on the queen side. 
So you'd need kind of a second front, something like that. So I believe that Grandelius found a much stronger move than knight c4 check. And as I mentioned, this part of the game, Grandelius played beautifully. He really did. Like, he did everything he's supposed to do. So king f8 is uh, uh, an improving move, but I don't think it actually contributes towards winning the game right away. So white could, so for example, white again could just push this f pawn, and I don't think that your king improvement helps your position quite enough. I think that you want to look for something more immediate. Uh, sometimes, like these positions, there are two types, right? Where there's a position you want to play improving moves, building moves, just trying to get your pieces better, and then there are positions where you have to strike because your opponents a little vulnerable or because you have a particular idea. The main thing for me is that this rook on a4 I just hate so much. <laughs> I really don't like this rook. A rem and a reminder to you guys, by the way, knight c6, knight b3 gets to the previous position, so that doesn't help black very much. Trying to push pawns on the king side, like white can usually just ignore you. Uh, like I'm never obligated to take your pawn, and that means that you're not really achieving all that much. So how do you activate this a4 rook? That's the question I would ask myself. b4, very nice. And this is the move that you want to play for, right? You're trying to break apart the pawns, and now your rook's going to come into the fray and take uh, d4. So once again, in this messy, messy game, Dubov has a very difficult choice to make. Does he take this pawn, or does he push c4? I think those are the main choices. Allowing black to take is probably not wise. So which choice do you think is better? Seeing some pushes. That's good. C4. Well, guess what, guys? You guys have better endgame instincts than Dubov, at least in this instance. Dubov took on b4, which I believe is a big mistake. c4, and the game still is immensely complicated. So black does have a very, very nice idea here. Uh, so I wanted to show it. So first of all, yeah. Uh, so knight takes c4 check is possible, but I don't think this is so clear. Something like this and a5 was one idea. But the problem is that white can get counterplay on the seventh, right? I can check. Play rook c7. So once again, this rook is awful, right? You can't just leave it there. You don't want to allow rook to c7. So b3, I think, is best. And this is where it gets really complicated. So if white simply plays rook takes f7, then rook takes d4 is a big problem. You're threatening a4. And if you take on b3, I take here. It's just quite a few too many pawns. So I think best is actually to play d5. And the idea is now after takes takes, your pawn structure is much more broken up. So for example, now if you take and I take, your pawn here is a lot weaker. So I'm threatening to play f4. I can play rook d7 and try to grab your pawn. This position, I'd say, is a lot more unclear. Um, so actually, rook b4, I think, is best, trying to push this pawn. But now white can play e6, a4. And this is where it gets crazy, e7. And keep in mind, not all of this is completely forced. And obviously, to find this during a game would be very difficult. So the idea now is if you try to play a3 check and b4, I actually can queen first. And here, I can. it looks like my king's in a lot more peril. But I can at least give perpetual. I can sack and give this perpetual if I want. I could also try to take your rook, but I, I don't know. It's, it doesn't feel all that winning or anything. <laughs> Uh, oh, wait a second. Yeah, yeah. So, oops, where did I go? Oh, no. Lost my place. OK. Uh, so it was c4, knight c4. This was the line I was looking at. So this whole thing, and this is kind of crazy, but I think that in the end, black's uh, doing OK. Uh, white's doing OK. So rook e4, I looked at. And here, believe it or not, white only has one move. And I want to see if you guys can find it. This is quite something. Because again, my idea is just to go here, and then my pawns are just going to go. They're just going to roll. 
Not to mention, if you know, I can just try to do this as well. Like I just have so many ideas here. So you need to do something very forceful as white, but what forceful thing can you do? Yeah, this is where insane in the end game gets its, uh, gets its name, right? And I think I mentioned this in one of our previous lectures. You can just prepare end game material, but I remember when I used to do this, I, before I would always just find the most complicated end games I could and try to explain them just to, because I, I take all the titles very literally. Uh, rook f4, very nice. <laughs> so the idea, of course, is if you take the knight queen. So you have to kind of check king a3. And this, again, is where things get crazy. If rook a2 check, king b4, b2, you actually can queen and then hide your king on a5, and white's probably doing OK, because <laughs> this king is hard to attack. This is how insane endgames can get, guys. So pretty crazy. Uh, there's also the move b2 immediately. And now you have to play rook b4. Rook takes a7, rook takes b2, so it's a bit more sane, rook e4. So black's still on top, but I think it's very difficult to win. After something like f3, rook f4, rook d2, takes, takes, check here, takes, takes. I think black's just, white's just in time, because if you try to play this, so a lot, capturing would just lose, because the king runs up, but you have this move, and you're just in time uh, to draw for white. So just again, to give you an idea of how amazingly complicated these situations are, uh, even for grandmasters, this is just really hard to figure out. So this is the insanity that these lines can get. But this was just one line. The other line is the move b3. So first of all, after knight takes b3, knight takes c4 check is completely winning. But I think rook b4 and trying to win a piece is pretty straightforward. So. The best move is c takes d5, rook takes d4, and this alt line also gets crazy. Knight takes b3, rook takes d5, white trades the, the knights, and you get to this rook end game. At first, my impression was this rook end game should be pretty easily winning because the white king is so far, but it's actually still not so easy. The time situation, I don't really know, <laughs> uh, I'm afraid. But I would imagine that trying to find all this with any period of time is very difficult. So in this position, yeah, this was actually quite interesting. After rook takes e5, rook takes f7. I think white's pawn structure is better, and this a pawn is not so easy. So it's better to play this in order to take this pawn instead. Because now if you try to play f3, I have rook f4, and this pawn's very weak. So you should take, take. And here things also get crazy. King c3, I think, is a very important move trying to approach the pawns. Rook g5, forking. King d4. And the key idea now is that you're going to play for a very strong e pawn. So you're not even worried about taking the a pawn, the a pawn so much. It's almost not so relevant. The main idea is to get active and get an active uh, king. And this is something which I'd say this pattern is something people should be aware of, that often in these rook end games, getting an active king and a strong pass pawn is more important than the pawn count. Because this final position, which I analyzed, white's you know, going to be still down a pawn, and black has connected passers, but white has the better king and the more dangerous pawn. So I think that this is very, very drawish. Was an hour ahead of Nils. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that makes Nils' play even more impressive, honestly. And maybe Dubov should have slowed down. But uh, I, I think that Dubov also, he lost a game on forfeit. Probably mentally, he's not in the perfect place. I mean, he's a professional, right? So probably he uh, can recover. But it's, it's a difficult situation, I think, for anyone, even if you're a pro. So in any case, I, I think that because white's pawn is very, very strong, uh, the drawing chances are very high there. So again, these are just some examples. Um, but uh, it's still not so simple. So rook takes f7, yeah, rook takes g4. And this is only one move. This is only one line that I give, right? There are so many different lines and variations. But the main thing to remember here is that as white, you only have to choose between takes b4 and c4. You don't have to see till the end of, end of the earth, right? You just have to see the differences. And I would say that c4 looks much more complicated and harder to win than c takes b4 does. Because b3 and, and taking the pawn looks scary, but it's clear that in the rook end games, you at least have some minor chances.
Whereas I would argue that after this, which is what happened in the game, and black plays knight c6, between the weak d4 pawn and the stable black pieces, this is just a dead lost position. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to be lost every time. In fact, he's still got his chances to draw. But I would argue that he should just not avoid this compared to the other line. Like, he doesn't have to see all the rook endgame stuff. Uh, we leave that to, to, <laughs> to computers and whatever else. But, like, in a game, you just have to see what is simple and what is not. And I would say that, that this is much easier to play and win for black than the other position. Because here, I mean, you, you want to defend this pawn with a move like knight f3, right? But here, OK, even a5 is winning. But if I just check and trade rooks and play f6, I think you're just going to lose. Because if you allow me to take, I create another protected pass pawn. And if you take and I take, I'm ready to play like this and bring my king in. And the a pawn's going to run. Like This is just not a position where you can hope to, hope to draw. So I, I think that pushing c4 would have given him a lot more better chances. So in the game, he played king d3. But again, it was not over. Knight takes d4. Rook c8 check, rook c7. So it's still complicated to deal with. It's not like this is trivial, but it definitely should be winning. So Nils plays very well at first. He pushes his pass pawn. Knight c6. So he's ready to, he's threatening e5. Dubov plays f4. These moves are all kind of logical because they're both taking stuff and improving their pieces, right? So a4 was played. Rook to c7. Rook to b6, guarding the knight. So this pawn is really very, very dangerous and ready to go. Uh, yeah, so we'll get to that at the end, guys. So hopefully not all of you have seen it. That's the one drawback to picking newer games that people are following anyway. <laughs> uh, so sometimes I give lectures on older games and stuff. I like to do that. But I do often like to you know, go over the games that are currently going on. So this is where things got very tricky, a3. But hopefully, even if you've seen the game, I'll show you things that are a little bit different. So this is a very tricky moment, actually, rook a8. So here, I think Nils starts to go slightly astray. So what are black's possibilities, and what do you think you should do, and why? That's uh, one question I have for you here. So here's the main question, right? You want to defend your pawn, that's clear. But do you play knight b4 check followed by a2, or do you start with a2? Or does it not matter? Sometimes it just doesn't matter. So a lot of you are saying a2. I do believe this is correct. But I think it's correct maybe not for the, very, for the reason you're thinking. So after a2, king c3. So obviously, you can't take because of the fork. Very nice. So what happens, though, after king c3? So now I'm threatening to take the pawn. The question is, what can you do here? And I think this is where uh, the correct approach to the position is really important. So take your time. What do you think you would do here for black? So a move like d4 check is tempting, but I'm not so sure it actually does that much. Like, let's say here you can play, um, it's actually tricky where to go with the king. That, that much is not so obvious. I think even king c4, though, the main issue you have is that your, like your, your pieces are actually not so easy to improve here. So I guess you can play rook b2, knight b3. 
It looks a little fragile for, for white, but this knight on c6 is what I'm eyeing, and that knight's really terrible. So I'm not really sure how you're going to continue here. If you try to play d3, for example, I can play king c3, I believe. And ah, maybe it's not so simple. You have rook c2 check, knight before check. Mm. Rook here. No, but then there's this. <laughs> OK, I I'm kind of playing through moves without thinking hard enough. Like, obviously, rook b2 is a bad move, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe not super simple here. Uh, all right. So knight a5 check, I can always take with a rook, I think. So in this position, yeah, rook b4, I think, is very strong. And this is the key. Like, you can play knight c3, but again, you're, after knight b3, for example, you're just, these pieces are stuck. You're not really threatening that much. So I think that this is also kind of the wrong approach. You can play knight a6, and this would actually be very similar to the game. But I, I really would not suggest uh, playing this way. Uh, there's also maybe moves like rook a4 here. I don't know. But rook b4. So this is the really tricky part about uh, trying to win a position like this. This is transference of advantage. We have our beautiful a pawn running up the board. We all want to queen it, right? But this is the key, that sometimes you can't queen it. <laughs> sometimes you have to give up the ghost. And the key is to be able to transfer your advantage, meaning you go from, well, I have an outside past a pawn to, well, I take the pawns on the king's side, and then I win because I have extra pawns. It's really hard to do that, because we all kind of wanted to queen our pawn, right? But rook b4, I think, is a really, really important move here. So if white takes, for example, and we take, we see why we do this, right? This pawn is weak. This pawn is weak. d4 check is a possible tempo move that's annoying. This whole position, black, white's whole position falls apart here. There's just no way that black, white's ever going to survive. It's just too many pawns. Let's say after this, for example, we could throw in d4 check, but even without it, we can take. Maybe d4, I don't know. But even without it, like let's say, let's say do it just to chase the king away, right? So something like king c2, knight takes pawn. This pawn's going to fall. Our rook's beautifully positioned to guard against this knight. There's just no way we don't win this position. So this is an example of how changing the approach can sometimes make, us, make it easier. If you're too married to one approach, if you're like, I must win with my passed pawn, that's when you can have problems. But when you shift, uh, to a different idea, that's often where you know, good technique comes from. So in this position, f5 would have been also a, a decent try, probably the better try. But here we also have a nice idea. So we take, takes, and then what is the key move now? Yeah, I agree, guys. Rook b4 is not so easy to find. Uh, but you're kind of using your a pawn as a distraction. That's the whole idea. Because white can't just take your knight because the a pawn has to be captured. So again, how do you how do you deal with this one? Uh, you can push back the king pelvix, but I would say that the main object here is not necessarily to do that. You just want to mop up all the pawns and win because you have three or two extra pawns, right? Two extra pawns is often plenty to win a game. It certainly is, Manny. I think that was one of the key factors here. So rook g6 is, is a rook hang. I'm assuming you mean rook g5, Ken, which is correct. So the idea is you're simply going to mop up these pawns. And again, white doesn't have time to try to take this knight or anything because the a2 pawn has to be captured. So you have to take it. Rook takes e5. And then once again, you're just going to be up two pawns. And at this level, being two pawns up is typically quite enough to win. So very, very nice. And uh, this would have been the better way to do it. So a2 is best, not because you're going to queen with a2, but to keep the b4 square open for the rook. But Grandelius was determined, dead set, to queen his pawn. And he thought he could and, and queen the pawn and win. But I actually don't think it was so simple. Knight b3 was played, a2. So rook takes b3 checks a threat. You must play knight a1. And probably Grandelius just thought this was winning. I don't think it's actually so simple, though. Uh, so here, there are different ways. I, I think that he probably could win, again, by switching his plans, but he was really determined not to. <laughs> so what, do you, what would you guys do here as black? This is, I think, also a very, very difficult moment. Because I, I think he has to change his plans, like, again. 
So rook b1 is what was played in the game, which I think does allow black, white maybe to escape. Not in an obvious way, though. <laughs> I can tell you this. Maybe rook c6 is smart to force the king to one side. And if king b3, you can go d4 and push a second pawn. Oh my goodness, I'm hearing a voice in this room. Can you guys <laughs> believe it? Uh, welcome, Caleb. Uh, and yes, Caleb, unsurprisingly, finds a very good move. Rook c6 check. So the idea now is if the king tries to go to the d file, you can play knight b4, and you're defending everything. That's not going to go well. So for example, let's say the move king b3. Now you play d4. And there's a very, very important point here, which is that after king takes a2, d3, rook d8 does not defend, uh, because you have the move knight b4 check, followed by knight d5. And you're blocking off this rook. And then the d pawn's very strong. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily the best for white. Like White probably would bring the knight over or something. But this d-pawn is quite strong. And once your knight gets off, you can again try to go after these guys as well as trying to queen your d-pawn. So I do think that this should have won. Uh, but this was the best chance. He played rook b1. And here, I think that uh, Dubov had a chance to try to draw, although it was definitely not uh, the most obvious the most obvious draw, again, like my eyeball test of this move was that it should probably lose. But when I looked at it deeper, it turns out maybe not so much. <laughs> so rook b1, what would you do as white? Obviously, the options are you can either take this knight, go to the rook endgame, or you can move the knight. Yeah. So rook a2, rook f4. OK, <laughs> one more time. So king takes a2 is better, because uh, rook takes e6 is there. But then rook takes f4, rook takes e6, rook takes g4. Yep. And black should end up with uh, the a2 d pawns left, which is enough to win, even if okay. the, the d pawn falls and white still has the e pawn left. So this Caleb's idea was kind of what I thought. So Caleb believes that rook takes a6 is losing. And this is kind of what I thought as well, and clearly what Dubov thought. Uh, but I think if you look at it closer, it's actually not so simple. And the main reason is because this black king, as I mentioned, is just a really bad piece. But this is where things come into play. So this position, white has to be very, very precise. So if you go after this pawn, something like this, I can play rook behind the pawn. e6, I have time to grab the h pawn. And once I grab the h pawn, you're kind of pinned. Your king can get back in the game. But by that time, I can kind of bring my own king in, get my rook behind the pawn. I, I think that. This black's winning chances here are extremely good. So I do think that this is a win. But white can be a much more clever. So in this position, what do you guys think is a possible improvement for white? Keeping in mind that you're basically trying to deal, like this is black, these are black's next moves, almost for sure. So what would you like to accomplish in this position? So rook e8 is possible, trying to push the pawn immediately. But I don't think you're in time. After rook g5, e6, rook takes pawn, e7, rook e5, the rook is behind the pawn. I can simply put it on e4, for example, so your king can't approach. And then I can just slowly start to push my pawns and even bring my king up. And you really, your, your rook's not very good here. So this is the kind of thing that doesn't ever really work. But king b3, as mentioned, I saw. Uh, is quite a strong move. So the idea is now if you play rook g5, I can simply bring my king in. And once again, we have the similar situation. But instead of just moving my rook, which is kind of useless, I brought my king in. 
And I think that this position you'll find very difficult to win because my king in, is so active, my pawn is very, very strong, and it takes a long time to push these pawns. Two connected passers often beat one pawn, but that's only when the, they're about even. And you have this thing where the king advances with the two pawns, eventually you sack a rook for the pawn and queen. That's what I was taught. But I found so many exceptions to this. And when the king and pawn are ahead of the two pawns, and you have such a beautiful king and, and you're ready to just march ahead, a position like this is almost impossible to win. And I think with best play, this should be a drawn position. The white king is simply too good. So uh, a better try maybe would be something like king g8. But here, white can try to change plans once again. So how would you play this in, in this position? Because now you're keeping the king cut off, right? So if you're able to play king f7, it could be very, very annoying. But yeah, having, having a, a good king, is, I cannot mention how important this is <laughs> in rook endgames. It, it's still the most underestimated concept, even though everyone knows you should do it. Rook e7 is interesting, but I, I don't know that it helps you permanently. Like, I can play, hmm, let me see, actually. Yeah, probably king, maybe rook e4, actually. So my idea now is that I have king f8. Uh, as a possible idea. You still have e6, though, so maybe not so simple. Yeah, maybe actually not there. Hmm. I don't think I looked at rook e7. Yeah, possibly, possibly you have to play king f8 first. So something like, so my idea is if you move your rook anywhere and I go here, this is a problem. So you probably have to go here. But now maybe rook g5? Not so simple, though. e6. I think I can do this, though. Take, and then the rook can come back here. Yeah. Not so simple, but I think it's good enough. So I think here, probably the best is to actually go after the pawn more directly. So now after rook g5, I can take. And the idea is that after king f7, king c4, you're still close enough to try to be able to escort your pawn. And here, you actually have this. And this was, this was the moment where I was very surprised. I thought that this was probably good enough with the king here. But after rook d4, it's actually enough to, to draw. And the main per point is that if you try to take this pawn, I can play rook d6 check. You can't take on e5 because of rook d5 check, and you actually lose, embarrassingly. So you have to play king e7. And now I play king d5. And once again, I have this very, very strong pawn. And after rook h1, I play rook a6. So even though you can check me away, this, the rook checking from the sides is just so annoying because your king has to go somewhere terrible, and then I start pushing my pawn. So this position also, I think, uh, should be drawn. And if you try to play uh, rook takes e5, I have rook h g4, sorry. Uh, rook h4 also draws, actually. I just wanted to illustrate. Rook g5, rook g4, h4. And the whole idea is that here, you go back, and there's no way to actually win this position. This is one of those draws because you, you can't ever try to take this pawn. For example, if rook g4, king g5, I just sit. Rook h4, I always have check. And the key here is that you can go here, trying to hold on to this pawn and attack here, but I check. And the problem is I just keep going back and forth, attacking your pawn and checking you. So for example, if king e6, I check, go back. And eventually, you can try to do this, but now the rook slides to f5, guarding this pawn. So it's very surprising to me that this rook endgame is drawn. Uh, I, I would say that it sounded to me, at least, like Dubov had some time. <laughs> uh, so he could have at least analyzed this. And I would say that he ended up just giving up a piece, right? Which probably should lose in most instances, although it's still complicated. But one of the things I'd say is that the two mistakes Dubov made this game, uh, in this endgame, the big ones, were his refusal to simplify. He didn't trade knights in one situation. And here, he also should have traded nines. So I don't know if this is a pattern with him or whether it was just misjudgment in two cases. But if I were a coach or something, I, I obviously normally would not coach a player so much stronger than me. <laughs> but if I were a coach, I'd be like, so is this a tendency? Do you always resist simplifying when you should? Because uh, sometimes players who like complex positions will not simplify when they absolutely should. 
But yeah, really crazy endgame. And I definitely think that there are drawing chances with best play there. Uh, but obviously not so easy to execute. In the end, he played knight c2. And this actually became really interesting because it looks like, OK, he's up a piece now. But after f5, <laughs> I've mentioned how much I hate this king, right? And this, this king is so bad, even here it is difficult to win because you have this beautiful pawn structure and you have discoordinated pieces. But Grandelius does a really excellent job, uh, especially at first. So he plays e takes f5, g takes f5. He throws in this check. The main idea is that the king here looks nice, but you can actually play stuff like knight b4 and then rook check and stuff like that. And it actually is uh, not, so, not so easy. Um, and you can actually, you can also check here, and the king has to then move away again. So moving up doesn't actually help, so he plays back. And then here, what is his idea? His idea, his move here, I really, really like, actually. And it's not such an obvious one. So he goes for rook f1. So the main idea is that if you simplify to this rook endgame, this is a lost rook endgame. You're going to take and go back. Notice how with the king on d4, of course, you could not do that. But then you'd have rook d1 check. Uh, and it's kind of weird, because at first it looks like, oh, just rook c6 should win easily. But it's actually not so simple. Even after a move like e6, just trying to do this, like, what exactly are you doing here? Uh, it actually does not look simple at all. Um, so. Like if you try to go here, then I pin you. It's like this is kind of one of those things where it looks simple and nice, but this is not simple at all. So rook back to f1, very very nice move. F6. So this move is also uh, very very clever because now, uh, what would you guys do here as black? Once again, I think he has to find very very accurate moves, which again at first he does. Yeah, it's a pretty good point, James, actually. Like in the, in the old days, you see endgames played really accurately. And it's not because they were necessarily better endgame players. Uh, actually, Yasser, I, I talked to Yasser about this. He really explained this to me well. He's like, they just had so much time and a million people working on them that they were able to find most of the details in these endgames. Whereas now, people have to play it on sudden death. It's a lot harder. <laughs> so. Yeah, so knight c5 was played in the game. Uh, taking the pawn, actually, it turns out, is not so simple, because I can throw in this check, very important, getting the king off this pawn, and then I take. And this position actually should probably be drawn, because, again, your king is just not good enough, and this h pawn serves as a very nice distraction. So even though you have the two pawns, because my king is going to be active in front of him, your king is going to be cut off, you're, you're going to find winning this position to be quite impossible. So. Taking on f6 is not best. Knight c5 is a good move. But it's still not over. He plays rook a7. And here, once again, black has to be very accurate. So what would you guys play? And again, I'm not positive that his way is the only way to win in each position. But I do think that he played this part of the game like very, very well. And it was only because of a mistake later he allowed Dubov to have some drawing chances. So to give you a hint, what's the piece I've been complaining about all game? <laughs> what's the only piece that makes this game complicated? Uh, you can't really take the pawn, though, because this pawn is, is quite pinned on f6. So yes, the king is the piece I've been complaining about. And king g8 is indeed the good move. Knight e6 looks uh, tempting, but after rook e7, you're kind of in the same bind, only worse, because your knight's attacked. So I think this move is very, very nice. So Dubov takes this pawn with check. So he has the connected passers, but at least the king is on a much better square now. So that definitely helps. <laughs> 
Dubov played rook c7. Grandelius plays knight e6. Rook b7. Knight g5, all of this is good. King e3. And this is where life gets very complicated. I do believe that Grandelius here uh, could have won. Uh, but it's, again, not obvious. Like, it's not easy. So what would you guys do here uh, as black? And the lines get really, really crazy. So you're, you know, it's very, very difficult to see everything. But I'm curious what you guys would go for. The key is about coordination. You need to make sure that your rook and knight coordinate well enough so that white can't just either draw with these continuous rook checks or be able to push the pawn or get the king too far in and stuff like that. Uh, like if white moves their king up, you have to make sure you have a defense to everything. So rook f5 was played in the game. Oh, oops. Oh, I was, uh, I was, I think I was fiddling with the bottom. <laughs> Sorry about that. So rook e1 check is actually a very clever move. So first of all, if king d4, you can play this check, and then this pawn drops, and that should be easy enough. Once you eliminate the connected passers, the, the win tends to be a lot easier, unsurprisingly. So king f4 is the move I would worry about. But here, it turns out that even with this king marching up the board, you're able to win. So the winning line is d4, king f5. And I was really surprised this was such an easy win. But it turns out you can play d3. And this is where things get uh, very complicated. So there are, two main, there are three main defenses here. Uh, if king g6, you can play rook takes e5. This is the important thing. And you're not getting mated with rook b8. Uh, and once you're not getting mated, the d-pawn should be very, very strong. So this is kind of the first thing. Simple enough, but you still have to pay attention. The other one that you have to watch out for is the move king g6. Oh, not the move king g6. Sorry, the move rook d7. Uh, yeah, and I should mention also the, the third one, you basically, if, if white keeps checking you, you get out this way. This actually helps black. So the best defense is rook d7. And here, this is where things get very strange. <laughs> so you play rook e3, guarding your pawn, king g6. So if you take here now, white can draw by playing check, rook e8, rook takes d3. And there's actually just no easy way to win this position because after something like knight f7, you're guarding your pawn, but you also can't really move. <laughs> so I could probably just move my rook like along here, or something like this. And it's really hard to actually win, because you're just constantly getting harassed. And rook's going there next. Of course, don't fall for this. <laughs> but apart from that, this is actually really, really hard to win, because your rook's so passive. That's kind of the key. So that doesn't really work out. Um, so you have to play king e8. And then the key is after rook d5, you have the move knight f7 now. And here, because you're behind this pawn, you're able to win. So kind of nice. Not crazy complicated, but allowing the king up, like checking the king up to f5 would be very hard to do in a game. And he wasn't able to do it, especially with limited time. Rook f5 is what he played. But here, it turns out Dubov is able to draw. He checks. So Grandelius is just gaining time. He forces the king to e8. Rook e7 check, king f8, and king d4. So the king's coming up the board. Grandelius plays knight f7. King takes d5. Rook takes h5. So king e4 was played, rook g5. And this is where Dubov maybe missed an opportunity. So the, way to, the path to drawing is a little bit hazardous, though. So the first move, I think, is obvious enough. What would you guys play here as white? I can give you the hint. King f4 is what he played in the game, which is a mistake which loses. But what other, uh, what move do you think he has to play here? e6, very good. <laughs> 
So if knight d8, I can just play rook h7. I'm threatening mate in this pawn. So once you lose the h pawn, you're not going to win the game. At least you shouldn't with king and knight. King, knight, and rook against king, rook. You have some chances, but usually pretty small. Uh, king and bishop or rook against king, rook, you have more chances. But uh, yeah, not going to do it. So knight d6 check is the best try, in my opinion. And here, it's very important. So this, this decision's easy enough. There's only one square which draws for the white king. And this is the tricky part. When you're facing knights in an endgame, you have to find squares where you don't get forked and, and checked all the time. <laughs> That's the hard part. So king f3 allows rook f5 check, and this pawn drops. That's not so good. King d4 and king e e e3 allow this knight check. So you have to go to d3. But here's where the tricky part comes. Rook g3 check. And once again, you only have one square which draws. And this is where things get a little trickier. And maybe this is where he wasn't sure. Um, I don't know if he used his time or not, but. Where does the white king go? So king e2 is a reasonable guess. But the problem now is after rook g6, rook d7, knight e8, you're kind of losing your pawns. If e7, king f7, I win easily. So f7, and now I take the pawn with check. And then my knight's free. Going to dark squares doesn't work. If here I check and take your rook, d2 is, I think, bad for a few reasons. Not because of this, but I think I can go for this move again. And the idea now is if you play rook d7 here, I can check and take your pawn. And that should win pretty easily. So you actually have to go to c2. So it's very illogical, right? You're moving away directly away from where the action is. But sometimes, like most of the time, you want your king participating in the endgame. But sometimes you just need that king out of the way. And the rook and two pawns do their job beautifully here. After rook g6, you play rook d7. Knight e8 again is forced. And then f7, and this is a draw. If you move the knight, I check here and you lose. So you pretty much have to sack the knight. And this is a pretty easy draw. The h pawn is the hardest pawn to win with. And this is no exception. This is just a very simple draw with king up. And eventually, you, you force the, like the king's even cut off. So after something like this, rook over, let's say you push. I just do this to, do, to force the rook away. And then my king comes up. And you're not going to win this position. Very counterintuitive, right? But sometimes the king just needs to be out of the way, right? But he played king f4, and it seems like most of you saw this game. Uh, but for those of you who haven't, anyone, here's the move that Dubov missed, and a really, really cool move it is. I actually have a good memory of moves like this. I actually, it wasn't knight h8, it was a move knight d2 to b1. I managed to beat uh, Gareev with in a US championship one time. And it was, again, a move he completely missed because it was a backwards knight move. So here, knight h8 is, is the idea. In that position, it was knight b1, uh, with the idea that the knight comes to c3 and is very strong. And here is knight h8, with the idea knight comes to g6. So that's kind of the, the whole up thing that's hard to see. But sometimes backward knight moves uh, to reposition the knight are very nasty. And this just wins because you just take all the pawns with check. Like He plays king e4. If rook h7, you can check. And no matter what happens, you just skate this guy with check. If here, you take with check. If here, you take with check, and it's just over. So he plays king e4, knight here. But now the knight's on a beautiful square. And there's nothing much to do. If rook e6, king f7 is an easy win. So you have to go here, check, h5, rook g7. And here, it's just a matter of coordination. Rook g5, knight e5. And I like this last little bit. He plays rook g7, hoping for this, <laughs> which is a draw. But Grandelia simply plays knight f7, and now the rook's trapped. And once you trade the rooks, it's going to be a very easy win. Something like this, you can take. And you just put the pawn on h3. And now the king's tied to it, and you just take and come up the board. Just make sure you don't do this with knight on g4 and pawn on h2. That happens to be a draw. But anyway, uh, really, really complicated game.
But this is what I'd call real life technique where there's lots of mistakes, there's lots of stuff that can happen. You saw there was really good resistance in parts. Um, but overall, it's really about getting it done and you have to be willing to change advantages and change how you think about the position a lot. And sometimes you can't win the way you picture in your head. You have to kind of figure out a way to do it. And with very little time, Grandelius did a great job of organizing his forces. And even though he made some mistakes uh, along the way, I thought it was a really, really cool and instructive game. So I hope that, uh, hope you enjoyed the end game. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it, it's amazingly complicated. Even analyzing it, it was really hard for me because I would come to my own conclusions and then sometimes I'd check with the computer and it'd be like, no, no, you're just wrong. <laughs> so that's the way it goes. Uh, but anyway, I hope you guys enjoy this lecture. I'll be here the next couple weeks, so stay tuned for more of them. Uh, but for now, I am off. So have a good night, everyone. See you.